<laughs> that, that might be why I get that impression. Oh, yeah. um, but my, the, the, the principle of this talk is I'm going to cover a lot of different fish. Um, it's kind of just to show you a lot of the simple similarities, even across the whole different genuses and everything like that for some of these fish. Um, I know cichlids, you might say, a lot of people say, like I've read a lot, I used to read a lot of uh, apistos and stuff like that before I got into catfish real heavy. Apistos for me were I put them on my tap water, fed them live food, if they didn't breed after two months, I start dropping the pH. I drop it like one point every, every time I would do a water change and see when they would spawn. It usually wasn't very hard after that that they would all kind of just fall in line, whether it be at 6.0 or 5.0 or 4.5. Um, so there, there's just a little technique to them all, and hopefully this uh, gets us all started on some of those. These are some of the different types of like whiptails that I've spawned. The top row here, the Eigenlani, Lanceolata, and the Maroi. These are the ones that typically spawn in the tubes, um, open-ended tubes. They don't get very big. The, the Eigenmane are pretty much in almost every river down there. They're so widespread in South America. This second group here is the lip rooters. They're a lot more attention. These guys will, the females lay a big raft of eggs and the males pick them up, carry them around, and hatch the fry that way. A couple of things that are really, really big keys for them. The biggest one possibly, water changes. My biggest success, success comes from big, massive water changes multiple days in a row. Um, this tank, there's act, there was actually only six little four inch whiptails, you'll see them later on in here, in this 40 gallon breeder, plus some cherry shrimp. I would do water changes, to get these ones to spawn it took 18 days of at least 20% water changes in a row. That sucked, I'll be honest. <laughs> Yeah, 20% water changes at least for 18 days. And it was cooler water, so by the time I was done, when I really dropped it down, there would still even be a little condensation on the glass. I was only able to do these guys in winter time because they come from smaller streams in Peru where it's a little cooler. Gotta have substrate, some kind of substrate. For the whiptails at least, gotta have real fine sand. I was actually in Home Depot, and they sell an even finer sand than this. It's called fine sand. It's real white and stuff like that, so it's instead of being yellowy like this one is. Um, I've actually kind of wanted to try it out because if you talk to anybody that goes down there collecting, they say all most of the sand in, in the streams is white. It's like pure white, like the table or your styros when you pull it out. It's just stained because of the water. It left a picture off of that slide for some reason. But they're supposed to be over here in the blank space. There's a few different size caves. Um, some D-shaped ones and stuff like that for if you're breeding any of the plecos or even some of the uh, some of those woodtail catfish do like to spawn in caves actually. This was he talked about Lou talked about Charlie Grimes. Um, first time I gave this talk, I had a probably about eight ten slides before getting a catfish picture, and someone said, you know, Charlie Grimes would slap you across the head because. It took you too damn long to get to a catfish, to any kind of fish. So, there's a nice one. That's an L25 Pseudocanthicus uh, species Pyrara now, Scarlet Pleco. Again, water. I use whole house water filters for my stuff. Um, this way, I don't have to, I don't treat my water for prime, with prime or any other dechlor or any water conditioners. The water just runs right through these special carbon blocks. Um, they're designed for chloramines and comes out, goes right in the tanks, perfectly clean, never, haven't had any issues with it. Temperature control, um, you can kind of see these are, these are big brass ball valves. What I do with them is there's one from the cold line and one from the hot line. Um, I'm not fancy enough that I don't, I don't have the area that, or haven't tried to set up one of those automatic mixing valves. That's probably the next step, but this way I can say, all right, I'm doing water changes on the whiptails first, and I want water 70 degrees or so, and then go to the pleco tanks and set one at 86. All I gotta do come here is just, I got the ball valve marked literally with a Sharpie for spots that it sits at, so I just turn it and bam, we're good to go. Testing is a big one too. 
you have to completely understand what parameters your water normally is and when there's any deviation from that. Try to understand why. Um, that's the sediment filters. That's just that guy. Whenever you think your water's clean out of the tap, that's two months of use. Um, and that's actually a light duty one. I have pictures of ones that where they're these are graded, so they're larger holes on the outside, smaller pores on the inside, so it catches most inside. But that's a lot of your heavy minerals, um, a lot of stuff that buffers your water heavily. So does it run through that one first? Yes, it hits that one first before the carbon blocks, then the blue ones. Yeah, so that way it's less strain wear and tear on the the big, the expensive ones. I'd rather change a ten dollar filter every three months than change a hundred dollar filter every four months as opposed to eight months. Again, your your meters, um, just for being able to measure all your things, your temperature, conductivity meters, pH meter, but it's not on there. Um, two big medicines, because some of the fish that I deal with, I've only been able to get wild. Um, there just aren't people breeding them where they only get one shipment of fish every three or four years, even a box of it that comes into the United States. Um, Bacterial infections on the whiptails, especially the lip rooters, is rampant. I don't even, I just always assume that every wild lip rooter I get has some sort of bacterial or fungal infection because if you don't, you're going to lose them three weeks later randomly. It'll be like, if you get them scraped, they had some fungus on them. Um, I use the Canaplex for that. Proform C is what I use if I suspect any type of external parasites or whatever. Um, I haven't had any issues with it killing my catfish at all. As long as you do, do the dose that it suggests, I don't ever overdose them. And additives for spawning. Um, there's some different things you can do to change the water. And that's what I'm referring to when I say additives. Um, like anybody here, if you use RO water, you use RO right, you add that back in. There's two different classification, classifications in my eyes, organic and um, inorganic. When I talk about organic, I mean alder cones, oak leaves, Ruby Boost tea. This is a very highly underutilized additive, in my opinion. Um, don't fall for any gimmicks that you have to go and get <coughs> organic Ruby Boost tea because it, it doesn't... There's no real such thing. All they do is slap that little word organic on it, and it's the exact same as this big bag, but it costs you four times more. Um, this stuff is very, I'm trying to think of the word. It, it doesn't hold up very well if it's exposed to any chemicals or anything like that, so they, can't, they physically can't do it or it destroys the plant. The when do you use that? Just like you would for your alder cones, except this stuff doesn't drop your pH. So if all you want is, um, you want to say, all right, we're coming in towards like, do a rainy season on your fish, all that stuff that gets washed in from mixing with the dirt and the mud and stuff like that from the rain coming down, that's what that'll do. It, it doesn't have caffeine, so you don't have to worry about that. And like I said, it's not going to drop your pH at all. So it's, it's very underutilized. Synthetic, that's the word I was looking for, for like your RO right, your discus trace, just to add some of those um, trace elements, trace minerals back into the water at times. I've actually had some fish that, some plecos that only spawn when discus trace is added back in because they're looking for a certain trace element in the water. Organics in action, uh, all this little brown stuff floating on top of the water, that's the Rui Boost tea. And you can see how it's very heavily tan and stained the water. I mean, you can't really see down to the bottom. And it makes the fish room smell nice. It really does. Um, especially on certain, if there's tanks that have been slacking on water change, trying to put through like a, a dry season, and it, it's smelling real bad in the fish room, I'll find a couple of tanks I can throw the Ruby Boost D in just to, <laughs> to make it smell a lot better. Um, you'll see these things a lot in my photos. These little Zis boxes are. Uh, internal breeding boxes. I don't have a lot of walkway space between my rack aisles in my fish room, so I tried those marina hang-on boxes, and for me it just didn't work, because if I was in one tank and I had 
two boxes on each side. As soon as I'd stand up and turn, I'd bump one of them and fall off the darn tank, and I'd, I'd yell some obscenities, and my girlfriend would come down and see what, what I did. And she's like, oh, it's just that, I'm leaving you alone. Um, but when I found these, it's also nice because they use the flow of the tank because they have mesh screens on each side, and then they still have a big uplift tube. So you can move a whole lot of water to keep water quality higher on the fry by putting more food for the fry to find in a smaller space. <coughs> Variety quality foods. Um, everybody says it. It, it. it means a lot. I mean, if all you're going to do is sit here and feed your fish flake food and you have a 12, 13, 14 inch pleco or wood tail, you're probably going to have to put half that can of flake food in a day, essentially, to feed that thing properly. Um, going to some of the sticks or the rapashi gels in this case, the rapashi gels are fantastic for fry because they can graze on it all day long. Just a different list. Hikari Massivore, that's almost the exclusive diet for all my Pseudocanthicus plecos. Almost exclusively. I mean, I'll deviate from that a little here and there. I don't bother with trying to go and worry about getting frozen mussels or frozen shrimp or anything. That's more of a pain. I don't want to have to thaw it. I don't have to cut it up. And I don't have to go to the store to get it. <laughs> this I can just order from Amazon or anybody that I, uh, one of the guys I know that own pet stores, they'll order a whole box of it in for me. And sacrifices do have to be made at times. Um, the, the next picture, I, I wish I would have had a picture of it the first time before the fish room really took over and started blowing up. Um, but there's only a few beers in here now. There's like barely, they're like tucked in back here, in behind the food up top. This used to have bachelor lifestyle. Two to three cases of beer constantly for when buddies want to come over and watch a Pens game. And now the issue is, is anytime I know I'm having somebody over, I'm like, crap, I gotta go out and get some cold beers so that more than two of us can drink tonight. Um, sacrifices have to be made at some times. You don't always think about it when it's happening, but... <coughs> These are those ones that I said took 18 days of straight water changes every day. These were actually a um, first in the world to be able to spawn this fish um, and successfully raise them too. These are probably only about four and a half inches long, but the massive barbel across their face for their mouth, they sift right over the sand and they'll feel like any little worms or anything like that. They're probably about three inches long right across the head. So this is kind of what I was talking about with when I had to use the, the cool water in wintertime. Um, my fish room does get heat from the main house from the furnace heat to help, but then a lot of the tanks still even have heaters in them because I don't want to keep the fish room at 90 degrees for everything. So these guys were just kind of residual effect of it getting a little warmer. It actually got up to 84 during this time period. And then I would change the water, and I, with the cold water changes, I would drop it down 15 degrees, 20 degrees sometimes, and not worry about it. They got a little annoyed at times, but they get used to it real quick. Even the fry held up with it. I mean, I would do 80% water change, cold water, condensation built up on the glass, and the fry would still be fine, too. You can see the female. Um, she literally looks like she swallowed like a shooter marble. They look like they're going to blow at the seams, and that's when they're finally ready. <laughs> There's eggs, finally. You can see he, he actually has his front, his whole lip wrapped around it. That's why you can't see the yellow eggs here. You only see them in the reflection. Um, I yelled and screamed. I actually even called my girlfriend while she was at work because she leaves for work before I do. And she's like, what's wrong with you? She's like, why are you calling me? What happened? And I told her. She's like, oh, that's it? She's like, you called me for this? I'm like, yeah. So, and she's like, I get it. But she's like, I thought something was terribly wrong. This is the first time you're calling me at work in the morning. They start to develop a little bit more. You can still see how his front lip is wrapped around him. And he's using those little 
little tentacles almost off of his barbels. They're like they're like barbels on his barbels, sticking off there. Um, the eggs are getting a little more orange. There are probably about they're in the neighborhood of uh, four millimeters, four to five millimeters, which for a little fish to hold to lay a raft of two to three dozen, four or five millimeter eggs is pretty impressive to me. Um, she still looked fat as all heck after she laid them even. Even more develop on them, you can actually see the fry start to develop in here with the, the tans and the blacks, and then even the, uh, the vein right there in that one. They finally hatched. Well, they're a pretty good size for a uh, for a lip reading whiptail. The lip readers typically hatch a little bit larger. Um, I haven't ran into one that hatches under a centimeter, which 10 millimeters doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're trying to feed a fish and it actually has a little bit of a stomach, this is fantastic. You'll see one later that makes this one look like it's a monster. This fish absolutely sucked to raise. Um, there have been a couple people that have spawned them since, and they've all experienced the same things, even with similar genuses. It went in a small container. All this these fry want to do is sit on the sides and like jam their noses up to the top of the water. So how do you feed a catfish that thinks it's an African butterfly fish? Well, answer is a lot of times a day with um, ceramicron or golden pearls or something like that where they just buzz around the top and then can just grab it. And it wasn't like one of them just did it. All of them did it. And it, it was a real pain because I had to go and suck up whatever fell in the bottom four or five times a day because they were getting fed five, six times a day because they, just, they were so active from swimming that it would just burn right through their stomachs. And you can even see it this size. Those barbels on their face are probably two-thirds of the length of their whole body. Yet again, another picture of them on the side. Um, you see their little hearts and stuff like that. They have the same pattern as soon as they get any color as the adults almost. When they finally do settle in, they grow incredibly fast. There's uh, one here and one back here. I actually had them to, to full size in, as it says, eight months. Um, full adult size. People, you couldn't tell the difference between the wild ones and the F1s in the tank. Now we're going to go to one of the egg layers. This is the Agamonite. These guys are, are everywhere down there. All the rivers is in the one of the most commonly exported fish. If, pretty much if you have a, get a whiptail, it's a, one of these ones, this type, and you have a doubt as to what it is. It's Aigamonai. They're not really picky. Um, I've had a lot of people breed them in just like lift tubes for like a sponge filter. You just take that and lay it on the ground. They don't care that they can see you through it. This species at least. Green eggs for uh, PVC tube. I think that was a three quarter inch one. They still like it a little tight. You can see that there's one bad egg. Um, this was the uh, the first clutch of them. So I was all paranoid and I took the clutch of eggs away from the dad figure and I put one end up on a uh, on a rock with an air stone in it so that the air would bubble through the tube and just move water through but not touch the eggs. It worked great, but having to worry about pulling it and then trying to hatch the eggs with like a little toothbrush, that's way too much time that I don't have anymore and more pain in the rear end than I wanna want to dedicate to them. So I just leave them with the male, and I'll actually take the male with the cave and put him in one of those breeder boxes now. Um, that way he hatches them, and he won't touch the fry once they, they hatch, but the females will actively hunt the fry to eat them. So this way the males, the fry are all safe. As soon as I come home from work and I see that they're all out, take the whole little PVC tube, put the male back in the, the, in the main tank, and bam, they're ready to roll. You can see the one bad egg turned yellow, a little bit of fungus on it. They didn't hurt anything, you can still see it's same spot, the empty shell. Um, they turn real brown, this is how you know they're getting real close to hatching. They go from green to, to brown, black. Um, you really don't even see the yolk in them anymore. These are a little smaller. Um, these are right around the, the one centimeter mark when they first hatch. Big green yolk sac. Um, 
again, the, the breeder boxes help is I first used to do these guys in shoe boxes. I would take them, put them in a shoe box, feed them, change half the water in the shoe box half an hour later, feed them when I came home from work, change water in the shoe box half an hour later. I don't like putting in time where I have to go to one tank and do a water change on it three, four times a day. There's nothing more annoying to me than that. And that's why those hang in the tank ones are fantastic. If you can move enough water through it, you don't have to change water in, <coughs> except on the main tank to keep up. Yeah? Uh, when do you get those uh, inside the tank meter Truthfully, right now, I don't know. Um, the, the company that sells them, it's called Zis, Z-I-S-S. -S. Um, they used to sell them to like super cyclists at, OC, at the extravaganza had them and stuff like that. Um, but they quit selling to them. They quit selling the bean I, I I don't know. But they only have like one distributor in the States right now, and I don't know who it's from. I know you can order them straight from them on like eBay, and they'll send them to you. It just takes longer. <laughs> You'll see later on that this first food right here, this oak leaves with the, the sponge, squeezed sponge, and then uh, even microworms added in to create this big nasty film that uh, sits on the oak leaves. That's about the best thing you can provide for any of these egg-laying wood tails because they'll sit on the leaf and they won't even move. They don't even have to move just like in the wild to eat. And they can just gorge all day long. They grow fast. Um, and three or four times a day with water changes in a shoebox just stinks. It's annoying. So I move them out of there as fast as I could before. Two and a half gallon tank. You can see the big orange bellies. These guys are actually getting brine shrimp. Uh, you can feed them brine shrimp from the first day they can eat. They're able to, to eat it. Two inches long after one month. They grow fast. Um, the only issue with that is, yeah, they get to that length, but they don't really put any body mass on. So they're two inches long, but they're still incredibly thin and can't hold a lot of food in their stomach. So you probably have to wait till about usually three or four months before you were consider selling them just because of body mass to make it easier. This is a fish that uh, I got from Ian Fuller at the last CatCon in Herndon, Virginia, uh, the All Aquarium Catfish Convention. He runs Go Wild Peru out of uh, the Madre de Dios region and he collected these so we actually knew where they were collected so we could positively identify them. So these guys stay smaller. They only get four inches long total. Um, you can see the male has the odonto on here a little bit on his fins, the little hairs, a little on his head. And then you see the yellow eggs. These ones are different because these are the first ones that have had bright yellow eggs from the start. You can see more of the yellow eggs. I mean, they're, they're yellow. There's no mistake in it. And they only have about three dozen. Um, so they're, they're very small spawns compared to the other ones where you get five to eight dozen. And you can tell that they're getting ready to hatch because all that yellow starts turning towards browns and blacks. See the, the whole development of the fry in there. That's that oak leaf and sponge that I was talking about. I actually shut, what I'll do is I'll turn the lift tube, the lift air, um, down very low when I do this so that it'll stick to the oak leaves. Um, I also take the oak leaves and when I first see the eggs, I'll start soaking the oak leaves in the tank so that they get a little bit soft so that they have that surface for all this stuff to stick to. And then after this settles down and in, settles on the leaves and settles down there, then I'll turn the air tube back up a little bit. As I was saying, these things are tiny. When you want to compare a, a mark on your ruler on the millimeter side, just the mark to know what it is, and it's three times as thick as most of the body of the fish, it, especially when you're somebody like me and you're only... You absolutely can't raise tetra, baby tetras. I've only just started figuring out a way that works for me to raise rainbow fish consistently. I'm terrible, absolutely terrible with small fry. And that scares the hell out of me because of that. Um, it probably took me three spawns to figure out how to deal with this even properly, even with the oak leaves and stuff like that. 
And as you can tell, I mean, they're seven, maybe eight millimeters long. And there you go, you see a bunch of them on the sand in there. Um, I've had a lot with the sand in the breeder boxes. I usually always put something because I do tend to overfeed just because of, so the food's always there. Because I leave for work in the morning. I don't know if I'm gone 10 hours. I don't know if I'm gone 12 hours. I don't know if I'm gone 14 hours. So I try to leave as much food in there as I can. And that's why all the flow comes in major handy on these boxes. Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> Well, when when I have something <laughs> special like those uh, those epistle work area that needed that, uh -huh. I kind of tell work to go shut a little bit. <laughs> so, so you don't feed them four or five times in a three or four hour. No, it's it's literally throughout the day. Like like those epistle work area, um, I would actually again this is where I'm going to sound really crazy. When I work woke up. Before I went and would even start the coffee pot, I would go out and feed them so that I would make coffee, eat breakfast, get a shower, and then by the time I would come back down, it's probably about another hour, hour and 15 minutes later, I would then suck up what sank to the bottom, put some more food in, then as soon as I came home from work, I'd just go straight back down to the basement, into the fish room, repeat the process, make dinner, repeat the process before bread. Repeat the process. What, what is the sponge that you're talking about? Just like any normal sponge filter that you have. Like a hydro sponge filter, just yeah. something soft. Um, and it, truthfully, as long as you trust the tank, as long as the other tank, it, it doesn't even have to be from, from the adult tank. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it could be from any tank that you know is disease-free. It just has, like, you're like, oh, I haven't clean their sponge in three weeks. Let's just, here we go, to kill two birds with one stone. Now we get to the knob nose whip toe. Um, this was an interesting fish because these were a U.S. first spawn for me, and it was funny because after about three months of people seeing me post these on some forums and on Facebook, all of a sudden all my German friends started getting this fish in. <laughs> and they hadn't wanted, they hadn't had them in five, eight years before that, and never had luck with them. And then they all got them in again and wanted to breed them. Um, these guys are neat uh, because they they live most of their life just buried in the sand. The neat thing about the wild adults and even the young ones, they're so I don't I've never figured out if they're just lazy or if they're ingenious. Um, my adults only ate, when I first got them in, for probably about the first three months, all they would eat was bait, live baby brine shrimp. But they would do it very interestingly. They would dig a pit in the sand so that all they had to do was move their head in a half moon shape. And the pit would get to probably about a quarter inch or eight inch deep. And then they would wait for the brine shrimp to collect in the pit. And then they would move their head, pick up the brine shrimp from this spot, then move it all the way back over, pick up the brine shrimp from that spot. The fish literally would not physically move while feeding. It just wait, <coughs> kept waiting for the brine shrimp to collect in its little pit. Which makes it hard to wonder if your fish are alive at times. Again, very susceptible to bacterial infections. Um, they kind of turn to get like little pale, patchy white areas. They just kind of fade. Instead of being like nice, clean, tan, it just fades to just very, very pale. These guys actually like the lower pH. Um, I don't know if that's what helped keep bacterial infections away for them on my wild ones. I know to spawn these, they would not spawn for the first tough two or three spawns unless the pH was five and a half. They like it cooler. Um, most of the egg layers also like it cooler. That 77 is a very key temperature for those hemolytic area like the Igamonii, the Marawai, and these guys too, actually. There you go, pH for the spawning. And it, it, it's great to see because you're like, oh, he has four or five dozen eggs. This will be great. I'll get all these fry. I'll need to distribute them around. Well, you start to wonder what's going on because he'll hold these for eggs for probably about 21 days, 18 to 21 days typically. 
And his lips, you can't see it in this picture very well, but his lips actually physically expand when he went. Okay. So his lips will actually physically expand when he wants to go to uh, to spawn. And yeah, I don't know how to turn it off so it doesn't like pick up with that some point. Yes. Yeah, it probably ran out of batteries. I went to the desk and they yeah, had right. to come yeah. back. So I'll get you some. We we'll all right. Um, so it's funny, you think, you'll be like, oh, four or five doesn't fry. Well, and he'll keep that many for probably about the first six to eight days. And then every couple days after that, you'll start seeing three eggs missing, three or four eggs missing. Like, you'll noticeably see the, the clump shrinking. And you're like, you dirt, why are you eating? Like, I'm feeding you enough. It, it just seems like whatever size that their lips grow to, they want to be able to fully encompass the egg mass with their lips. Which is great, except, like people, we grow different heights, well, their lips grow different sizes. One male would only carry 16 eggs to hatch it. I'm like, I hate you, you're the one that I don't want to spawn, because my other male would carry three dozen. I'm like, you're, you're wasting a whole female for half the number of eggs. See, see how tiny that is compared to... <laughs> This is the one that probably, I think this time he only had like 12 eggs in his lips. Kicked one out, that's what happens, they just drop out. Um, and you see it just stare back at you. I just thought it was kind of a funny picture, woke up in the morning, went in there. And this was actually when I used one of those marina boxes. He was the first one to hatch, that one actually didn't make it, I assumed it hatched, and it hatched about a day and a half too early. That's never a good thing when you get one that hatches way before the other three. The other eggs. You can see much larger egg mass. You can see how dark it is here. These ones are real close to uh, to dropping. These fish get five to six inches. Um, I kept a group of six of them in a ten-gallon tank. Just a sponge filter, a couple oak leaves, and a sand bottle. Most of the day they just lay in the sand. They they don't need very much. Um, they're very once they got acclimated, they were very easy to care for. They started eating black worms after, was when they started spawning, and then they would start to eat prepared foods when I started introducing for all the fry. They let the fry grow up right in the tank. That's why I didn't pull them out. He can, he'll hatch them. Females don't eat them. He didn't eat them. I would just swirl a bunch of microworms every two, three times a day in there, and the fry would do Testing. There we go. That's better. Um, this two, two and a half to three weeks is usually what I like to call the, fra the, the fragile stage for all these whiptails because at that point, if you don't have any major die-offs, you know everything up to that point was done right. If you start losing two a day, two a day, two a day, two a day, so you almost have none, it's because they didn't get enough food when they were smaller and younger. That first week and a half to two weeks, they didn't eat enough, and then they're just died. They were they looked fine. They were still living and eating, but now they're dying off because they didn't, they starved to death basically from the first. That's what I mean. That's you got adult, 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 male on eggs, fry of all different sizes, probably about a month old, freshly hatched ones. This is all just that silly ten gallon tank. Um, at any given point, there was probably thirty to eighty little guys in there. You, you don't always need, because these are small fish, they don't create a lot of bio load. Put a big oversized sponge filter in there and that's all you need. Just don't let, just don't overfeed them, let food sit around, stuff like that, and the water quality still stays up, especially if you just feed live foods like baby brine or Daphne or stuff like that to them. Another lip rooter, um, everybody's probably seen someone, some similar to this, the, uh, <laughs> Laura Carey species out of Oppo, the crying whiptail. Um, these two are pretty much like sister, spe sister species. Um, I put a finish for mine just because I didn't have a collection location or anything. And the one difference between my fish and the crying whiptails, this egg raft that they would lay, I usually ended up with about four dozen. Jeremy and a couple other people, Jeremy Bash out of Columbus and a couple other people I know that were sprawling the crying whiptails, they would get like 
60, 60 would be a small spawn. 70 to 80 was an average spawn. They've even had over to 100, over 100. And their egg mass, the eggs would actually be stacked on top of each other at some points. Like, it could be up to three or four eggs high. Um, these guys have never, ever, ever stacked an egg. When I had them, it was all one flat egg raft. You can see, developing, I was actually, it's kind of neat to see how he actually rolls his lips and to hold the top of the clutch. I was actually taking these eggs away from him, and right as I did, I'll get back to that in a sec. So, these guys again like it warmer. 82 is on the cool side for these guys to spawn. They like the 84 degrees. Um, I kept them in a 30 long, and they never did anything. I, I had them for three years like that in a 30 long. Females massive, they'd act like they wanted to spawn, wouldn't do anything. I put them in a 40 breeder, Three days later, he's holding eggs. So they just need space to be able to do their dance to court and then lay the eggs. These ones actually hatch faster. These ones only take about 10 to 12 days. This is what happened to that egg raft as soon as I took it away from that male. It hit the air and then I put it in a box and everything just, they just all hatched instantly. Um, they look kind of funny. They have this. It's like they have this little big hump on their head. They kind of look like they're all deformed uh, when they first hatch. It's kind of weird. I actually worried about them at first, but then they just grow to nice, normal fish. You can see, again, sand. This is one of those zist boxes again. Um, all their yolk sac is gone. They still kind of look kind of funky, like got this real big, like, rounded head, and the head looks out of place on them. But. Different fry growing up, this is, I moved them to a 20-gallon uh, a long for grow out. And this is what happens when you get them. Um, you see where they have different colors, like black head here, a little white clean area, and then a black dorsal, all black ones. And then there's some plain ones that only have like the black dorsal. It's kind of funny because if you take one of each of those colors or two of each of those colors and you put them in a different tank, come back in the morning, they've all changed again. Or sorry, if you took like all of like the black ones or all of one color, they'll be three different colors again in the morning. So there must be something that they just do this just to camouflage, just for camouflage in the wild. These guys just started coming in in the uh, probably about the last year and a half. Um, these are the true, I actually need to update that. I need to take that out. I missed that one, sorry. These are the true chameleon whiptails. These are the true apithanas. The smallest one here is about eight inches long and probably about two and a half inches across the head. These are very stout fish. These are very large fish. Um, a guy from Indiana, Lee Van Height, was actually the first one in the United States to just breed them this past week. He just took uh, the egg clutch, I think it was on Thursday. It, it's neat because they have three different, three real different color patterns to them. Um, you can even see here, this one doesn't have any banding at all on it. This one has the black stripe on the head, black bar in the middle. This one just has the black bar. But then, so back to those bacterial infections. See all these little tiny, just, yeah, just, just kind of thumbed out, like soft color spots. That's all those fungal and bacterial infections. It took me about three weeks to get rid of it all on these guys. It, it was a pain in the rear end. Here's the color forms again. This is the, the red or brown, whatever you, color you want to call it. Um, they're the most popular one. They do look pretty stunning, especially when they go full color on that. And this fish has that, that red brown and then a black stripe, then red brown the rest of the body. They need sand. These guys will bury themselves. Uh, they're in a 125. I have two pair of them in a 125 right now. I don't even look to try to look for fish. I have a trio of red rainbows over top of them. I just try to find eyeballs in the sand. People are like, why do you have an empty 125? I'm like, right there's an eyeball. There's two more eyeballs. And then I just shoot the sand away. And I'm like, wow, I never would have guessed there was one of those in there. I'm like, there's four of them. There's four 10-inch fish in there. You never know it. Again, kind of neat, you can just see the, the red one, how it has that, that crazy pattern, just changed everywhere. He's more bright in this one, he's a little darker here. 
Another little pseudohemid on out of Peru. Uh, there's a couple that they've come under. He's come under the tiger name is what they just get exported as. Real big eggs for this guy. This is a four inch fish and he probably had, those eggs were probably five millimeters, maybe six. He liked it real warm. I hurt my knee right before Christmas and I didn't get down to the fish room. Had all had the door closed and it was real cold outside so the, the furnace was really kicking on. When I noticed on uh, New Year's Day, when I was feeling a little better, I saw the temperature because I have uh, like one of those indoor-outdoor uh, monitors for like your temperature, humidity, those little weather stations. I keep, instead of putting one end outdoor, outside, I keep one down in the fish room and then one up in my kitchen just so I can see what's going on. So I can monitor humidity and air pressure and stuff like that. It was 92 in the fish room when this guy decided to finally have his eggs. I measured the water, it was 89 degrees because he's in the top rack, top tank. So we think of fish coming out of Peru, liking it cool. <laughs> 86 was never even good enough for them. They needed really, really warm water. That's off, that should be an 8. Again, lower pH, 6.0. Just in a 20 gallon long, two males, two females. 12 days to hatching, another only 10, 12 day one. Um, there's a little guy, this little thing over here that looks like a pebble. It actually is a, a fry. Uh, it's the first one to hatch. That's still on the eggs there, and that was the female. They do the same thing as those simulima. Different colors. There was this, this brown and black one. There was these tan ones, and there, there was a little brownish one that I didn't really get a good picture of. Two months old, you can tell there's still one dark one, but now they're all pretty much starting to look just like mom and dad. Um, they're several centimeters long. I mean, he's just about just closer to five, and then back here towards nine. So two months old, he's probably pushing two, two and a quarter inches. four months old, and they're almost caught up to the adults. There's a huge growth difference between two months and four months. <laughs> it was unbelievable to me how fat. These fish were actually adult size in six months from, from eggs. That is a different one. That is not a Peru 2. That was a, uh, this was just for a size comparison between the two different species. Um, I called this one the frog eye. He kind of looked a little more flattened and he had big frog eyes that stuck up on the top of his head. Never was able to find another one for him, unfortunately, a female. This is one that I actually uh, donated these guys, some of these fry, uh, for the raffle, or for the auction. These are the fish that we used to call Happy Thanos um, up until a year and a half ago. They only get four and a half, five inches long. Uh, they get these real nice stark white, stark black colors. They call them the badger cat also for that reason. So technically the name for them is Affinis Thanos, or I actually prefer, and, Norman, and a lot of us have preferred to start calling them species chameleon, just so that there is that segregation that they're not Thanos at all. I've never had more than 34 eggs in a clutch on these guys. I just pulled these ones the other day. This is actually a fresh picture I took this morning. You can tell these ones are real close to this. I'll probably go home Sunday and get these eggs to hatch. I'll pull them out of water for 30 seconds, put them back in, and then all the fry will come out. Light helps with these too. If I take a flashlight and put a light on them, you can actually see the little fry in there start moving around and trying to hatch at that point. Um, but they like it's like bright, focused light. Like they can sit in this tank with the light on it all day and it doesn't affect them. You put a flashlight on, the fry start going crazy inside the thing, start hatching. Just as little fresh hatch guys, again, they're around that about one centimeter, maybe twelve millimeter range. Um, yellow or jig sack. Even as fry, they're kind of neat because they get white marbles and they kind of have the brown color and stuff in them, but they don't keep it. A lot of these go back to being just black and white ones. I don't know what makes them keep this brown color. I have a pair that is, 
but the prayer or the brown ones haven't spawned. They want nothing to do with any other fish, and they're the meanest fish in the tank out of the group of ten of them. They attack the other eight like crazy. Cute little guys, even have a little whip tail already at that size. These are about the size of the ones that are turned in. You can see even they do the whole different pattern thing, kind of kind of modeled off here. This one's nice and nice stark colors on them. And then all black. That's the one thing that's real nice. They're very tolerant of a wide temperature range and they're okay at it. Um, They've bred, that group has bred from 75 degrees up to 84 degrees without any issues. Hasn't affected them, hasn't spawned more or less. They eat anything. Any kind of, any food you want to put in there, is, they'll, they, they go crazy over it. Now, now we're going a little bit different. Now we're going to get to some of the plecos. I'm going to fly through these a little bit faster. Um, these are just some of the different ones that I've spawned. We'll go, you'll see most of these in the talk. This Ancestrus agavoensis is L32. These are actually Ancestrus minutus. Uh, Daniel Von Ketter, Daniel Kahn Vetterlein, that was here at the Extravaganza, heard him talk. He came to my house, and when he saw them, he's like, you have the real minutus. I'm like, no, these are agavoensis, what are you talking about? And he's like, no, this is, so we've been, sharing pictures back and forth, and he's like, you have the, the real minutes. He's like, please don't call them that anymore, this, this name anymore. <laughs> so, These are other ones that are in the, I donated some in the, the auction. Uh, you can see the male. When he spawned, he was only four and a half inches long. Big clutch of eggs right there. These guys only get to about eight inches. They're slow growing as heck once they get to five inches. Uh, he'll probably be 10 years old before he hits that 8 inch mark the way he's been growing. So, and when they want to spawn it, when they'll spawn at 3.5 inches, you got some good time to bring them and turn them in for BAP before they get that full size. <coughs> these guys like it cooler. Uh, these guys Ferrar from around Peru. Um, 80 degrees is real cool for any of these plecos. Most of them like it 86. This is the rarity I found out. This was just because the other ones were so young. The best way to do any of these sudas, when you know male and female, is separate them into a pair. You, like these guys, you could put a pair in a 20 long, and they'd still be okay. Um, the problem is, is when they go to breed, the females try to drag, they get jealous, and they'll try to drag the male, and then get the other female out of the cave, so they're the one that spawns. We've had it happen with numerous different species of them. I use the Porter foam filters on them. Uh, so this species prefers square caves, white ones on top of that, for some reason. These are the easiest ones to get to spawn out of the ones out of the three species I've spawned, and a bunch of my buddies spawned. These are just like clockwork almost. That's the other nice thing. You can take these eggs away, and if the male kicks them. And you don't have any issues. This is just one of the. This is a, a specimen container. I just put an air stone with a rock on it to hold it in place, and I would change the water in it once a day with completely fresh tap water. Wouldn't use tank. Nothing that's ever seen a tank. Just straight out of those filters. Temperature didn't matter. I could put 40 degree 40 degree water in there, and those eggs are still fine the next day. I you change the water on because of that stuff. All the protein that those eggs seep off and creates all that, that bubble in the foam, like a protein skimmer basically would take off. Once that's gone, it doesn't affect the eggs at all. Bunch of fry right there. Um, that was the first time I tried that hatching method and it, it worked. Six weeks after being hatched out, you can see they're already, already about two, two centimeters long. Um, mine have always kept this real nice color. Uh, yeah, you have some ones that are prettier and some that are uglier. I mean, that's just the way it is with them. But once they're at this size, they still keep that same color all the way to adulthood. Uh, if you Google some of the pictures of these, some will show like a clear slate brown or slate gray fish. I don't know where that person got those fish or what conditions they're keeping them in, 
but clearly it's just that fish does not like their water that they're in. What do you do when you get 120 to 200 fry? Well, they like to pack on each other so much that they'll actually beat up each other's fins, start chewing on each other and kill each other, which in turn, if they kill the one in the middle of the bait ball, guess what happens to all the water around it? It goes to crap. And then ones on the other side of that bait ball, or on the other side of that dead one, start to die. So it's a very terrible domino effect that you kind of got to learn, and that's where the, um, the Zis boxes help again, because they can provide so much. You can put, you can hang this in the flow from one of your mat filters from like a lift tube, or even a sponge filter if you put like an elbow on top of it, and then the box provides so much extra flow. I did a little experiment. I cooled one, I split up a group and I cooled one tank off. You can see six degrees, and believe it or not, the cooler tank, I think I lost two fry completely. I think I only had about 10% make it to adultwood out of the, the warm tank. So they like it a little cooler. Everybody says everything's always, you always gotta go hotter all the time for stuff. Some things, I don't know why, just play with it and see what works best for you. Pseudocanthicus L185. Uh, this is a big 12 inch male. Um, I would rival his pattern against any 66 or King Tiger Pleco that you would find. He's just stunning. You'll see a picture of him later coming up. He's, you can tell he's so Odon toted up everywhere. That's how you can tell he's a male. He, he, could, he could pop 800 balloons in a row and put them back to back. And that's the female. You can tell she, she's not real spiky. She has the adoptives on the body and stuff, but they're, they're just not, they're soft, basically, is the best way to describe it. Breeding, 82 degrees. Uh, this worked with two males because that big male was just so dominant over the other male that the other male wouldn't even leave his cave. Like, the other, he didn't leave his cave the whole time during the spawning process to eat, and he he was too scared that he was going to get the tar beat out of him. I always you like to use large canisters. I use FX6s on my Suda tanks. My Suda tanks are mostly 125 gallon tanks, 180 gallon tanks for a pair or three fish in this case, um, and port foam, like a matten filter if I can on one side too. That's the mail. When he's looking all nice and pretty and happy, and he wants to spawn, he actually turns this purple color. Beautiful looking fish. Uh, you figure that fish is a solid 12 inches, and he's probably a solid 7 to 8 inches high with his dorsal raised up. And even the female, she turns purple after she spawned. Kind of neat to see that. The fry, when they hatched, they were just completely white. They had a little bit of darkness on their head, but they were completely white. Even when they started to color up, they just started to turn slate gray, and then two little spots by the tail. You can see, this was uh, one of the better pictures that I was able to have of them. They actually got these little white dots on them in their pattern, and then some clear barring in the tails as they were growing up. These fish, these same fish are now four or five inches long, about a year and a half old. They grow a little slower. Um, I'm expecting them to, to shoot off real soon here. I actually had one grow up in the tank. I didn't even know it was there for a year and a half. It, it buried under the matten filter and lived behind the matten filter. I never looked behind the matten filter. I, I was ripping apart the whole tank the one day and someone went, Phew. I'm like, wait, there's only a pair of fish in here. What, there's, there's two 10-inch fish in here. What, what is that? And I go and I'm like, huh, there's a five-inch juvenile from fish that were in here two fish species ago. I'm like, how'd you hide for a year and a half? And being five inches, it's not like it was that big only. <laughs> these are one that I'm working with. I got these about four years ago. Actually, three years ago. I got them at three inches. They're now starting to approach eight inches. They aren't as stark a color as this one. They probably mostly look like that one. The spots are a little bit smaller. This is a fish that a lot of people have difficulty getting or uh, keeping alive after you get them. One of the reasons is they don't keep them warm enough, for one. Minimum after you bring them in is 84 degrees. 
Either 86 or 88 is better. That's a huge one too. If you get plecos that you're worried have gone through uh, any sort of treatments like bacterial or fungal or deworming processes or anything like that, it kills all of their gut fauna. And especially herbivores like these guys, like strictly herbivores is young. I put silly little bushy nose plecos, albino bushy nose plecos in with them that are probably closer to adults. And what actually happens is when those bushy nose poop, all that other, all that bacteria, all that gut fauna gets mixed into the water and then they start breathing it in and the, the, uh, the gold nuggets, it actually gets in through their system and helps them. Um, because one of the issues with this fish is you'll see your fish be fine for two, three, four months, full belly, everything, next day it ends up dead because it's starved to death. It, it can eat, it just can't absorb any food. That was the biggest thing I found with these things for when I first got them in, uh, for food-wise. They wanted a pellet or something that would expand and dissolve very easily. They didn't want something, they weren't going to eat something that was hard to the texture, because in the wild they're just eating that, that slime off the rocks. So they want something very soft that they can just pick up, they don't even want to chew it really. So anything that dissolves, like those spirulina sticks, algae wafers, um, they took the catfish chips after they've been in the water for like a day, they would eat them after they're real soft. This is another one everybody likes, the uh, the queen arabesque. The, uh, eh. On the L1 some of the summits, have you spawned them? Not yet. They just finally started, um, at the 7 to 8 inch mark, I'm starting to tell males and females. They're starting to get... Uh, the odontodes on their cheek are starting to get real long in the males. And the females are actually starting to get real chunky. So they're actually due for a, a tank move. Um, they're in a 75 right now. <coughs> the seven of them, it's kind of cramped. They're, they're going into an eight foot tank uh, in the next month here. So they'll have a lot more room and I'm gonna crank the temp temperature up on them. I'm trying to crank it up towards 90 and add a bunch of power heads and we'll see what happens. But, so this was the female. Um, the picture here is kind of distorted a little bit just because of the car trying to squeeze it in, I apologize. But you can see how our pattern's all goofed up here. He was so abusive to her on their first spawn that this was just down to, to straight flesh and actually she was physically bleeding. Like you could see all the, the marks run. I thought she was a goner and I was annoyed because anybody that's ever tried to bring, get this fish wild, you get about one female for every 30 if you're lucky, that you bring in. So, I, I wanted to kill that male when they first trapped. I really did. I didn't even want the eggs, I just wanted to kill him. Um, but she healed, and her pattern just came in wider. I was like, wow, I was stunned. They'll both get very hairy, um, they'll both get very fat. The males just get more hairy. You can see the eggs down here in the corner past the male. Uh, it's kind of hard to get a picture past these guys sometimes when they're in tight caves. Again, real warm, 86 degrees to spawn them. Uh, they, they prefer soft water, not a whole lot of hardness. And that's what it looks like after a few months of them doing their job well. You got young ones here, you got six, eight year, eight, six to eight month old ones here. It takes these guys six to eight months to get to an inch for sellable size. It takes a long time. These guys grow slow. But for a fish that only reaches two and a half, three inches, you kind of get it. Freshly hatched fry. Again, big yolk sac, plain little white fish, black eyes. Two days old, you can see they're starting to get some pattern in them. Yolk sac turned from bright, bright yellow to kind of orangish. Multiple ones growing up again. They just keep their pattern the same way throughout growing up. This is a nice fish. Um, I'm sure we've all seen the pictures of Andre's tank holding that little stark red and black fish in his hand or Ingo Seidel doing it. These fish have an extreme amount of variability in them. More so than, it's pretty similar to the patterns on the, the Jingu hype and sisters, like the 333s, the 66s. Um, but they still always have these big, wide bars. You'll actually see some of my fry coming up. 
I have some that probably about two out of every clutch has been very different and unique and almost starting to get towards the line. So if you'll see like two bars on the body and only three bars on the head and then the, the pattern on the fins is like reversed. So they'll have like a black stripe edging the fin and then the rest of it will be like all red. Again, warm. These were the guys that I actually had to add the discus trace to. I had to make the water harder for them to spawn. It was normally it's too soft. This guy was worth his weight in gold. Unfortunately, I lost this male. He actually would trap a female and get eggs while he's still tending the previous clutch in there. They like to hide in the wood a lot. These are some of those special weird pattern ones. You can see one, two, only three. Two lines really on the body past the head. And then even kind of has just a U shape of lines right on the, the face. I'm trying to grow all these guys up and line breed and maybe turn these things into like super red L306s, like those super whites you see on Facebook and stuff that sell for like a thousand dollars a piece. These will never be these? Three inches at most. Most of my uh, my females are about two and a quarter, my males are about two and a half. L398s. We, uh, you guys saw Andre's tank last year. I think it was last year you had Andre's tank come in and uh, give a presentation. This is the panoculus that was named after him from the Rio Jingu. Again, real warm, 84 degrees. These guys like real tight caves. Um, almost no room to see past the fish. The females could barely fit in, but that's what they liked. They never got trapped or anything like that. For these, these are the one guy where the adults, they're one species where the adults, I fed a lot of the repassion to. Because that morning wood provides a lot of high fiber, um, just so it keeps their, their gut metabolism moving. They spawn pretty young, year, year and a half for the fry when you grow them up. Again, you can kind of just see past them. I mean, there, there's almost no room, but that's where they, they were breeding in that cave. He, he failed at doing his job on this spawn, and he started kicking them out. I hated him. After that, he was good. I will leave my plecos with the smaller ones, with the eggs for the dads as long as I possibly can. Um, I'll start pulling them only when I see that the yolk sacs are, yolk sacs are almost all consumed. That way I don't have to dig through, break the whole tank down to dig out 30 fish in three months. It's just easier to pull when you're young, pull the cave, swap a new cave, and then put the cave in a, in a breeder box and give them an oak leaf to eat on. Not very big. Um, once they hit about three quarters of an inch in length, if I took one of these fry and put them up against a leopard frog, a 134, you'd never tell the difference between the two. Stark yellow, stark black. And that's my motto for you guys. More catfish and less cichlids will make you very happy. That's a Pseudocaritica serratus. We started seeing those out of uh, Suriname. Um, hopefully, we're actually doing, my buddy's doing to get a big male in the next two weeks, so hopefully we'll see uh, some of these start coming around as tank raised in the next year or so. But thank you guys.